Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Gastronomy Tourism Seminar again. And I hope that you are enjoy our lunch. Okay, in the afternoon, Kun and he, uh, she would like to introduce you to the guest, special guest speaker today. Okay, first of all, I would like to introduce Mr. David Barrett. CEO, Hype Global and Broad Member and Co-Chairman, Marketing Committee of Thai, Thailand Incentive and Convention Association, and an expert in Thai mice industry who has incorporated experience into business events. Please welcome him. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about I'm going to be talking about the innovation of modern tourism, the growth, history, and the demand for culinary tourism, and the opportunity that we have for enhancing the culinary experience in Thailand. This travel trend is, is simply delicious. And uh, let me introduce myself, as uh, you just mentioned. I'm the CEO of Hype Global, a branding and communications agency. I'm a board director of the Thailand Incentive Convention Association and on the marketing committee as co-chair. I'm a board member of the Thai Indian Wedding Association and have been working in the mice industry for many years and incorporating culinary experiences. I enjoyed food from a very young age. This is me in 1961, enjoying food and sharing it with my sister. Um, so just an introduction there of who I am, and I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Tochai and the university for inviting me here this afternoon to share my uh, views and information on the gastronomy tourism. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about what is gastronomy tourism, breaking it down to the, the basics, uh, the world history of food tourism, the opportunities for Thailand, and gastronomy in terms of mice, how the food tourism has been incorporated into Thailand's mice industry. Uh, but first, I've got a question for you. Do you know this lady? Does anyone know this lady? No hands? OK. Uh, her name is Lucy Long. And she is the professor at um, Bowling Green State University in Ontario. And she was the first academic person to mention the phrase gastronomy tourism, food tourism, and culinary tourism back in 1998. And at a conference in 1998, Lucy said this, that gastronomy tourism is defined as the pursuit of a unique and memorable eating and drinking experiences. It Culinary tourism focuses on the search for the best-in-class food. People will travel miles to go to somewhere where they can try uh, the world's best of a particular dish. And it's a subset of cultural tourism and not to be confused with agricultural tourism. That's exactly her words back in 1998 at a conference where we first started talking about um, the industry and the impact of culinary tourism and gastronomy tourism. And culinary tourism is a recipe for economic and uh, development success. Um, it provides an experiential journey related to a particular lifestyle that includes experimentation and it provides an opportunity for learning from different cultures. It's, it's very easy to uh, have a touch point with a culture through that culture's um, cuisine and foods that are on offer. And the acquisition of knowledge and understanding. Through food, you get a better understanding of the people and the places that you're visiting. Uh, as an example, one of the first places I went to was Spain as a young boy, and still the memories of the paella, paella the rice dish, and also the fresh fruits, the fresh peach uh, that I picked off a tree. So the destinations become a very close relationship with the reputation of the food. And the culinary specialities produced in that region are very important. Dining in a destination 
um, is considered to be one of the top three favorite activities of the visitor experience. Uh, so there's sightseeing, there's other activities that people may uh, be going to museums, they might be going to beach for snorkeling, they might be going mountaineering, and dining, dining is considered uh, on, in a US survey to be one of the top three favorite, favorite visitor activities, and I think that's universal amongst many, many uh, cultures and countries of travelers. And more than 90% of tourists dine out at least once during their holiday. Uh, so that pre presents an opportunity of, uh, for the market to tap into uh, a tremendous buying power. Local cuisine is a motivating factor when choosing a destination. Uh, one of my former colleagues was uh, working in a, uh, a destination not far from here, another country, and he posted on his uh, social media that is, he is on a one-week diet. And uh, we said, why? And he said, the local food and he can't wait to come back to Thailand. So some places have a very positive image and an attraction for food, which we're blessed with in Thailand, and some are seen as not attractive. As an example, when I went on a sales trip to India and with the Thai delegation, I said, why are your suitcases so large? And they said, oh, they're packed with the mama noodles. We can't eat the, the spicy Indian cuisine. So it's, a very, it's an important factor in choosing a destination. And ca the culinary element speaks to all the five senses. Sight, sound, touch, taste, and uh, smell. And so it's one element of the tourism that has an incredible sensory um, experience. And we have great memories when we smell something and it takes us back to our childhood. Gastronom gastronomy tourism, so it incorporates visits to and engagement with producers of food. Uh, the visitors might be attending a food festival, a gastronomic festival. Uh, which have become very, very popular now around the world. A food fair that's more local and presenting uh, the local cuisine. Farmers markets have become I immensely big and Thailand has now started um, promoting uh, local farmer markets, which gives an opportunity for the local producers. Cooking classes and demonstrations, which I think we do exceptionally well in Thailand. Um, tasting food and wine. Uh, on the wine front, Australia and South Africa uh, and France have some amazing products that they're putting into culinary tourism from the wine side. And obviously making that pilgrimage to a famous food vendor. You know, sometimes I will make a trip across town uh, because there's a particular street uh, vendor that is serving what I consider to be the best food within that category. And uh, whilst I'm making a trip across town, um, friends and family are making an 11,000 mile journey to also sample food because it's driving their choice to travel. Uh, Europeans like going to Italy. And uh, one element that Italy is very proud of recently, it was declared uh, by UNESCO, a, the pizza is now a world heritage treasure. So whilst we have uh, Ayutthaya and Sukhothai as World Heritage Sites, hopefully we'll be seeing Tom Yam Gung and Pad Thai as a UNESCO World <laughs> Treasure, um, hopefully fairly soon. The cuisine of a destination is an aspect of utmost importance of the quality of the experience. And that's why my colleague uh, was on social media saying he was on a diet and couldn't eat the local food uh, because uh, he went to a place that was not blessed uh, with good food. And destinations and particularly local vendors are now being recognized on the global stage. Um, I thought we would be up there, but within Asia, Singapore has beaten us to this, as there's a vendor in Singapore who has just received a Michelin star. Um, this is the vendor, and so the very first um, Asian street vendor uh, to receive this Michelin star. And I think this will lead a trend where we'll start seeing more international accreditation of vendors. An amazing accolade to see that street food is now getting the recognition globally that it truly deserves.
But who is the food tourist? Who are we targeting? A tourist who takes part in new trends of cultural consumption? Travelers seeking authenticity of the places they visit through food. And I think that's the important word that we're talking about today, authenticity. Food is evolving, particularly street food in Thailand. And we need to uh, ensure there's an authentic element to what we are presenting to the visitors uh, or travelers, be it domestic travelers and the international visitors. Uh, the food tourist, the foodie, is concerned about the origin of product, and that's why there's a rise of organic produce, and they're very supportive of these small co cooperative of farmers rather than the mass-produced. Um, if I'm traveling somewhere, I would probably f um, take an extra journey to find somebody who's got the local Gaiban chicken, uh, rather than going to KFC, knowing that chicken is one of six million that's come out of uh, CP Group this week. Uh, so the uh, element of seeking the authenticity and the origin of the products, the recogni they recognize the value of gastronomy as a means of socializing. So no longer are we eating to live, we live to socialize through food as a connecting uh, element, as a space for sharing life with others and for enhancing experience. And I think that sharing is very relevant for Thai food because a classic Thai food is with the family style sharing and quite unique. When I first came to Thailand and all the dishes were laid out in front of me, um, I was waiting for my own portion as we do in Europe. And it was quite unusual and um, liberating to have a, a great sharing experience. So I think we're blessed on that element. And tourists have a higher than average expenditure. Uh, it's known globally that tourists that are traveling specifically for food are likely to spend more than your average group tourist. And they ha also have very high expectations and are demanding and also appreciative. So if those expectations are not met, then uh, quite often they are voicing that on social media. And if their expectations are met and exceeded, then again it helps drive the destination through the social connections that we now have. So visitors and tourists plan their trips partially or totally in order to taste the cuisine of a place or to carry out activities related to gastronomy. And uh, those elements, as I mentioned, uh, which the most important is authentic experience, uh, they're buying a more sophisticated lifestyle. And sophisticated lifestyle doesn't mean dining in a Michelin star restaurant. It can be uh, dining as an adventurous person on a, a street uh, stall that you've seen on television uh, around the world. Uh, they're looking for a pleasant environment. And the joie de vivre, they want to have the good life. And uh, unusual and unique dining experiences give us that. There's an economic well-being. So as I mentioned, the uh, foodie tourist is more likely to spend uh, much higher than your group tourists. And they're looking to sample an exclusive, high-quality, locally grown produce, not something that's bought in a supermarket and put in a microwave. The opportun opportunity is here, uh, globally as well as in Thailand, to grow and diversify culinary tourism. Uh, the tourism also promotes local economic development. There's considerable investment and uh, revenue that goes into local economies from gastronomy tourism. And it provides us with a partnership of the professional sectors, the producers, chefs, markets, and tour operators, where we're all uniting to present the product uh, into the industry. Gastronomy tourism cannot be bland. I am not going to travel 10,000 miles to go to McDonald's. And I think uh, this is the... Uh, challenge that destinations uh, have in presenting and maintaining the authenticity of dining and presenting that so it isn't bland. That's the opportunity we have in Thailand. And the gastronomic, gastronomic destination Places are the backbone of gastronomic offerings. So the places also have to be picturesque 
Um, and picturesque can also be a bustling street in Chinatown or in Pratunam, if you're sitting on a street that is totally different to your normal uh, lifestyle. Uh, the international visitors will see that as quite a, an interesting and engaging experience because they're looking for that local identity. They want to be a touch point. Tourists, in, in, when I was working for the largest inbound tour operator, we were just, and that was, I left six years ago, we were just on the cusp of a wave where tourists were saying, we don't want to be stuck in a bus and be taken to the Grand Palace and Vimar Mech uh, Palace. We want to get out and meet the people. And now the tourists that are embracing meeting you, the, the ties at all levels of society and trying the food are the success stories of tourism today. And um, gastronomy encompasses the environmental and landscape values. Um, I want to know that my food, if I'm eating off the street, has come from a, a, a respectable source and is not piled up with insecticides and pesticides and that there's a history, culture, and tradition that we can see through the food that we're dining in. And uh, Thailand, as I say, here we're at home and we're blessed with very distinct regions that we ha can present and gives us an opportunity for branding the gastronomy tourism. From the north, there with the Kantok, to the south, uh, to the northeast, uh, the very spicy somtam, and then to the central plains where I see the food elements and ingredients are more, the coconut milk and a sort of milder element. So with those four regions of Thailand with the cuisine that I've been promoting in business events for many, many years in Thailand gives us incredible product and also very clear branding. Uh, this is what the, there's a World uh, Food Travel Association and last year at um, their global conference, they said that gastronomy tourism is driven by today's intense social media activity around the world. And the unique culinary experiences, destinations are developing local food themed travel products and promotions to evolve their brand story. That is so true in that social media is the driving force of why we now see the tremendous rise of gastronomic tourism. And the best way to experience a destination and its culture, as I mentioned, is by the food. Food connects us with the land. It uh, connects us with the heritage, the people around us. Um, it's also a topic for sharing stories, forming relationships over food and building communities. You combine food and travel and uh, I, on the food side, the food plus the drink, and then it offers an authentic taste of the place. We are selling edible culture of a place. That's the whole proposition internationally. Food tourism is any tourism experience in which one learns about, appreciates, and consumes food, drink that reflects the local, regional, and national cuisine, heritage, and culture. Um, I was trying to find statistics of where we stand in Thailand, and I couldn't find them, and I'm sure they're there, but I was looking at the US and a recent survey of 2015, and 52% of US leisure travelers travel and learn to enjoy a unique dining experience. That's half of the US travelers are driven by some dining experience. And the value of that US market in terms of culinary tourism expenditure is 231 billion US dollars, uh, according to University of Florida uh, back in 2014. Uh, that's a, a tremendous uh, spend in tourism, and I believe that we have similar uh, within Thailand. Uh, the U.S. planned 39 million, uh, or 39 million leisure travelers last year um, planned trips around a destination based on culinary activities. And uh, then you've got impromptu and another 35 million seek out culinary activities after a destination is decided upon. So it's really interesting. You've got 39 million Americans, before they travel, they are planning their travel based on food, uh, which is a very, very powerful uh, segment of the market. And uh, 
if we look at the Asian market, and obviously within tourism over the past few years, we've been dominated by China and India. And this is relevant in that preferences in food are especially important to the Asian traveler. Uh, the food factor is likely to keep the Chinese within Asia rather than going further afield to Europe because of the familiarity of the food and the rice base and noodle based dishes. But the international markets, we, we have competition. The US are, are fully aware of this, uh, as is Europe. And the Plaza Athene Hotel New York introduced uh, Chinese dishes onto their breakfast menus. They've put in-room tea kettles with Chinese uh, green tea sachets. And they've put also Chinese items on the lunch, bu lunch buffet. Sheraton Gateway Los Angeles uh, last year added steamed rice, congee, and soy milk to their breakfast that's not been on their breakfast buffet before. Why? Because they want the Asian traveler and particularly the Chinese. So the food is driving now the growth of business, not just to us, but globally. And as I mentioned, social media is so powerful. I wasn't doing social media until I stepped into Hype Global, where we have uh, many clients that are looking for social content. And this is just something that uh, a pad thai that I had at a food festival at Central World and posted it on uh, my Facebook as one of my first pastes when I became reactivated. And it's amazing the amount of friends and colleagues who actually went over there and were posting similar uh, image of this dish. And it's the power of social media. We're sharing images on social media. And it's one of the most popular things to share. And that has uh, resulted in the rise and growth of the culinary tourism industry. Uh, the factors um, are food-focused media. There's a farm-to-table movement. Within TSEP, the Thailand Convention Exhibition Bureau, we have Sampran Riverside, who are now doing an organic food program. And with Kun Wirasak, the chairman of uh, the board of TSEP, uh, they are promoting farm to function, to business function, to meetings. And more meeting planners are looking for uh, the farm to table, i.e. the organic element. And also high profile local cuisine events are helping on the promotion. So our social and cultural identities are expressed through food. And as I mentioned on an earlier slide, uh, the Americans, and I think it stands for uh, the world market, um, you've got tourists who are planning their trip. So there's planned travel around food. Somebody doesn't even start traveling because the first of all they say, I want to go to Thailand and I want a food experience. I'm going to take a seven day uh, food course, uh, Thai cooking class and travel around Thailand because it's food based. Um, six years ago at uh, DMC, I put together a food-related tour for five days for Singaporean group that wanted to come to Bangkok and um, up to Chiang Mai purely around food. And then they put it into the market, and over five months, they secured 30 Singaporeans who were keen to come. So that's happening worldwide. You've got the planned. You've got included, which is in incorporated food experience in your itinerary. Uh, so, uh, people going to London, there are some restaurants by these celebrity chefs that you have to book three months in advance. And I, people, I know people who are booking uh, their travel and also booking that uh, lunch or that dinner experience as part of their itinerary. But it's not their main motivating factor. They're going to a destination for other reasons, uh, but they incorporate food within the itinerary. And then the impromptu, which is the biggest sector of this whole um, gastronomy, um, tourism industry, and that's impromptu. People are in a destination, and as we know, nearly 100% of tourists are buying a dining experience outside of their accommodation. And that is where they may come and hear a recommendation from concierge, from somebody that they've met, and they will go and have a dining experience in a restaurant or on the street. So that's the introduction to um, world tourism. I want to talk about the history as the second point, and I'll be quite quick because I know I've only got an hour. 
And uh, 1970, I just took it as an example, and I, that's not me, by the way, but I asked myself, would you like some raw fish? And I think this is a, a question that if you ask people in Thailand back in the 1970s, would you like some raw fish for lunch? Oh my gosh, no, it's not cooked, it's not clean. But now, if I was asked for raw, raw fish, I would jump at the chance because look at how sushi has traveled around the world. And my parents say, you're eating raw fish? Uh, they're very sort of closed in a little village. They've never been to a Japanese restaurant uh, and they cannot understand. But the power of this food and how the equity of that food and the country has now traveled globally. And uh, another element is the organic the environment, the vegetables, sustainability. Everything we're talking about now, most of those words were not on the vocabulary when I was dining in London in the 1970s. Uh, we never talked about organic. We never talked about sustainability. We never saw Japanese food until I came to Thailand. Um, it was a very closed um, environment in the UK, maybe not the best uh, environment for cuisine as we know the Brits isn't one of the best, uh, but now the world is talking about organic. People are traveling for the wildlife, the vegetables, sustainability. And that's come across because of the social media. And I think the history of this whole sector has been driven by the social media. And here we have um, this Japanese fish market, the world's largest fish market in the world. And um, who would have thought that um, it would become popular and it would be a driving element for international tourism? So there's a chef from the Japanese market that's in Bangkok tonight. And if you go to the restaurant, uh, it's the 8th and 9th, so on the 9th it's from 5 to 10, and they're promoting this particular market. A classic example of how um, food is now being incorporated as a tourism attraction. This is the market. Eight decades ago, in 1935, the new market was completed. It was the birth of what would become known as the world's greatest fish market. これからも好きな<笑> ま、<笑> And maybe, maybe the intensity is partly the passion. I don't know of any other place in the world that has such a, a long history of rich traditions. It's one of the seven food wonders of the world. And to me as a chef, it's one of the, uh, I mean, if you're an archaeologist, you go to the pyramids. It's not the world. It's the world. It's the world. It's the world. 
誰に匹敵するなら世界中に行ってもらう Over decades, it's seen the world change and millions of people come and go. The name of this market is Tsukiji. Ten years ago, we probably wouldn't have heard of that, and there wouldn't be the tourism that's now engaged in that market. It's drawing tourists from America, Europe, and within Asia. Uh, driving the tourism to the local destination. And a few years ago, before social media and all this media coverage we were getting on food, nobody would have thought that that market could drive tourism. In America and in Europe, this effect is called the Bourdain effect. And that's because of Anthony Bourdain,、uh, an American adventurous food traveler who's been to Thailand, went to Chiang Mai. ไปมันสองตาค่ะก็ได้ใส่บวกพอใส่บวกแล้วลูกค้าก็รู้ว่าใส่ร้านใส่บวกนี้ก็เลยเป็นเอกลักษณ์ค่ะ The lady with the hat stands out among the dozens of street vendors across from the old city's north gate. The best cow cow mu or stewed pork leg in the city, potentially、wow. none finer in Thailand.、Yeah. This is a sauce that goes with it. It's kind of like a sour chili sauce,、uh -huh. and then you you gotta have some of these pickled mustard greens too, pak dong. Yeah, it's really tasty. This place is is famous as hell. Like half the people here are tourists, probably Chinese tourists. ค่ะตอนนี้ก็พูดถึงเยอะค่ะคนกินนี่ทั้งประเทศเลยค่ะเวลาคนกินแล้วบอกว่าอร่อยแล้วก็มีความสุขค่ะ Anthony Bourdain's been there. He covered it. Now I, that's inspired me. I want to go and try that cow cow mu, and it, it's such an impactful element. And again, this effect is is not just、uh, for a one off destination.、Um, it happened with Korea.、Uh, when you look at Korea and tourism, you could say, okay, well, tourism in Asia to Korea, yes, there's been K-pop, and Gangnam Style has driven that. Or you could say aesthetic cosmetic surgery is driving, but I, I think food is one of the biggest elements that's catapulted Korea、uh, on this gastronomic tourism trend, and it is the show that I think most of us know. The taxi driver even knew it when I mentioned、uh, Dae Jang Gum、um, here, where what a great ambassador of food, and when that was、uh, shown around Asia. We saw tourism to Korea just go on the up, and、uh, it's amazing how you have these、uh, TV shows,、uh, whether it's a drama or whether it's a documentary,、uh, that can drive this whole sector of、uh, culinary tourism, and it creates destination equity. That's what I'm calling it. So we've got equity with the food that's relating to the destination.、Uh, Korea, Anthony Bourdain. McDang and his father, the founder and originator of culinary tourism, promoting、uh, all this food.、Uh, so the destination equity, food that's yummy,、uh, that universally everyone says, yes, it's such a great cuisine, which we have in Thailand. Food that's famous, and food that is accessible. And if 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 I go back to the UK, I'm quite surprised because the Tourism Authority of Thailand. Um, have a software program on their website. You can key in a,、um, a postcode and find your nearest Thai restaurant. There are over 650 Thai restaurants in the UK. Most British people, if they haven't been to Thailand, they've had a taste of Thailand before they've travelled, and that's really important. The accessibility of the food. And millennials are driving this trend, not just with the social me media. They demand authenticity.、Um, they want the local ex、uh, experience, and their travels need to be experiential, which they're sharing on on social media. So this is driving the, this、uh, whole sector. Ten、uh, factors、uh, for gastronomy tourism success, not just in Thailand but worldwide: leadership by the country and by the chefs and ambassadors within that country. Market-ready culinary products and resources. So it's not, oh my gosh, Thailand wants to be part of this culinary experience. Now we've got to go and create some dishes.、Uh, we have that resource there. 
an integrated strategy at national level. We're blessed uh, with the um, Ministry of Tourism and Sports and TAT drive, driving this. Partnership and community-based collaboration, which we're seeing with the street vendors and also tour operators. Financial support and performance measures that we're getting. Destinations with good access from key geographic markets. Uh, Bangkok is an aviation hub. Sufficient market intelligence, what's actually happening and where should we go, we have that. Food tourism resources need to be distinctive to the region. And where better than Thailand with those four regions that I mentioned, north, south, northeast and uh, central. A critical mass of food tourism experiences. So you're not coming, if you go to Italy, okay, pizza, pasta and maybe a soup, minestrone soup. Uh, that springs to mind. But when you come to Thailand, there's such a wealth of diversity that we can present as part of the package of that gastronomic tourism experience. And effective destination marketing organization, TAT, plus also the tour operators, very, very effective. We tick all those boxes. So uh, the popularity, the variety, and the authenticity goes to make up that whole destination experience and the proposition that we are selling to the market. This is just a video on uh, Chiang Mai organic market that an American lady uh, posted on social media that I just found. Uh, there were over 100 videos. I just clipped this one. So there's a wealth of information on gastronomy tourism that is flooding my um, social media channels. And today's social... Uh, so culinary conscious tourist is concerned about the origins of the products. They use dining as a means of socializing and enhancing experiences with others, have a higher than average spend on trips, a high degree of loyalty. They'll revisit the destination based on the food experience. And in the past seven years, gastronomy tourism has developed primarily because of uh, social media. And it's one of the most dynamic and creative segments of tourism. It gives us an opportunity to partner between the destination management companies, two operators, that's the DMCs, chefs, restaurants, and food tours, all coming together. And it's great to see this uh, private sector partnership there. And um, in a survey of 135 destinations done by uh, a, the a European um, tourism organization, 88% of destinations consider gastronomy strategy as an important part of their destination marketing for um, this year and their image. What's driving gastronomy tourists? They're looking at cookery workshops. This was a survey of uh, just over 2,000 um, uh, travelers for gastronomy tourism done by the University of Florida in 2014, museums, no, food events, food fairs, visits to markets, and food tours. So we see food events is way up there, and also the cookery workshops, Thai cooking classes. Um, it's not about eating fancy food and drinking fine wines uh, uh, and local beers. It's a reflection of a sense of place and the region. What I'm eating, I want to be able to relate to that destination. Uh, not something that's been important, imported and doesn't relate to that. Uh, people will travel thousands of miles for a sense of the destination through the food. And the survey in 2015 showed that 60% of Americans and 50% of Brit British leisure travelers indicated that they were interested in taking a trip to engage in culinary activities within the next 12 months. So this year we can expect worldwide uh, the 60% Americans and 50% of Brits traveling on some foodie tour. And in the past seven years, the tourism has, in, for us, for Thailand, enhanced Thailand's tourism offering. It's generated additional economic opportunities for local growers and processors, not the big boys, and also provided a new generation of tourists with cultural experiences that they seek. 88.2% of member countries of a 2015 survey considered uh, gastronomy 
as a crucial element in their brand and image, as I mentioned. And 68% of those countries consulted are promoting gastronomy tourism this year. So we're not alone. This is not something that Thailand has discovered. There's a lot of competition. But the benefits are economic, social, and environmental. So there's a lot of benefits to the destination. From ec economic impacts, we've got increases in employment in rural areas because foodie tourists are traveling beyond the main tourist destinations. There's a decrease in rural to urban migration. So less people are coming from Chiang Mai and, or um, Isan into Bangkok because they are, their livelihood is now being sustained by food tourism, whether it's domestic tourists or international. It reduces economic leakages. We're not losing the opportunity of somebody traveling because we don't have that food opportunity. It promotes fair trade. The local producers are being paid a better uh, fee. As I mentioned, with TSEP and the farm to function, the growers of the rice are now getting a much better fee that, or price per kilo than they are if they're selling it traditionally to the middleman. Um, it attracts a high spending tourist, as we know, and it extends tourism beyond the traditional hotels and tourist restaurants, which is great for the tourism spend at large. The environmental impacts, preservation of open space and agricultural uh, areas. Growers are more inclined to stick to organic methods if their produce is being bought uh, and then linked into the gastronomy industry. Uh, we, it brings respect for natural ecosystems, pr promotes organic farming, support, supports the small-time farmers and cooks, and also local cuisine has low-carbon miles. Um, in the mice um, business, I started introducing uh, local cuisine, where we weren't doing smoked salmon from Alaska, Alaskan crabs, um, Italian authentic pizza. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's uh, far better for the environment. And then obviously the social impacts. Food is an expression of culture. Uh, we've got the uh, flavors uh, developed through the history of Thailand uh, based on local environment, history, trade routes, and the settlement. And it's an important component of local social and also religious practices and celebrations. Driven by today's intense social media activity around the world, culinary experiences Destinations are developing local food-themed travel products and promotions to evolve their travel brand. And some statistics I pulled off the web. Uh, we know that 88.2% are being motivated by food when they travel. And that uh, growth is increasing. From 2006, 41% of Americans were motivated by food. That increased to 50% in 2013. I think we'll see a dramatic increase because the more we share on social media, the more people are going to be driven to travel for the food experience. And around um, a third of tourism spend is on gastronomic experiences. One third. And looking online, some of the world's most popular food festivals, they're listing Melbourne, Philippines, Singapore, Spain, and San Francisco, and the attractions. But no, in that report and a couple of others, nobody's mentioning Thailand. And I think this is an opportunity for us within the country to start packaging and promoting with TAT more food festivals. And whilst watching CNN last night and thinking about what I'm talking about today, up popped this. And there's an interesting feature that's being presented on CNN this week about the rise of Dinorama. Um, it's a gentleman in London who saw some empty open space and um, he started this thing called Dinorama where the Brits can go and they sample street food in London. And um, in the last five months, CNN reported that he has generated 4.5 million US dollars from this enterprise. So an amazing example of gastron gastronomy and its impact in tourism. So what's on offer? Uh, you could do a French culinary class in Paris. You could do an um, Italian one-week uh, course in Tuscany to learn Italian food. Spanish cooking class in Spain, in Sevilla, uh, or a gastronomic adventure in Peru. 
Uh, these are all um, being put in front of me on social media. Um, when I was doing searches, I didn't actually get presented with anything for Thailand. Or a taste of New York in a weekend is another option. And wine tour uh, week, oh sorry, for, uh, a wine tour week in Yarra Valley, uh, just outside Melbourne in Australia. And also there was Stellenbosch, which is a great area outside of Cape Town, which also does wines, and they were listed. Um, and I think that's an opportunity for Thailand to do more promotion, uh, because on this website where I was looking at what's on offer, uh, there was no mention of Thai cooking classes or Thai experience. But the good news is we are appearing on the map. And so I looked at this and called this up. And if you look at the hot destinations for culinary experiences, Bangkok, a bit blurred, is there. We're red, we're hot. And the blues are to watch the upcoming destinations for culinary tourism. And social media presents us with an opportunity for Thailand's culinary development. You don't have to be a partner with TAT to be using social media and to present your favorite dish that may then create a pilgrimage of people to follow because they want to try your recommendation. I'm always saying where I think the best Khao Ka Mu or uh, Kamok uh, guy is, and then people are following and they say, no, it's not the best, you should go here. And so we're interested in recommendations. Quickly, opportunities for Thailand in terms of gastronomy. And um, this was CNN survey that was done in 2011 of the world's 50 top dishes. And interestingly and good, we, it links from number 50, which was the least popular of the 50 dishes worldwide. And nicely, Thailand has three there. We're near number one. And so Som Tam, Pad Thai, and Tom Yam Gung, as you would expect, in the top 10 dishes that are rated uh, as the best food that you should be sampling around the world. So we've got a great opportunity here. And as I mentioned earlier and showed this slide, over a third of tourist spending is devoted on food. So what does that mean for us in Thailand? Okay, this is a slide I presented to some uh, students from um, California who were in Bangkok last month. And we were just talking about the history of Thai tourism. So the last paragraph there, 2016, the forecast um, for this year in terms of revenue receipts for tourism is 2.4 trillion baht for tourism. And now the reforecast a few months ago was 2.58 trillion. So that's a, a lot of tourism coming into Thailand. The length of stay, Europeans staying um, just uh, over 17 days, Americans just under 15 days. If I'm staying in a destination that long as a leisure tourist, I'm going to be dining on local cuisine. So a great opportunity to target this market segment. But where are they going? And if we look at the trends, uh, this was some uh, information I got from the Tamasat uh, Tourism Action Group and also the World Tourism Council. Um, mostly um, the Australians, Canadians and US. Well, you've got a variety from Central, which is Bangkok, the East, which is Pattaya, Chombri, Gossamet, the South, peaking there with um, Phuket, Gotsamui, and the Southern Islands, and the West, Kanchanaburi. Very few people going to the Northeast, Isan, which actually changes when you look at the dispersion of the foreigners against Thais. Thais, uh, as you know, are, you're traveling more uh, equally from Bangkok, you're going to uh, the East Chombury, uh, a lot more to the North. Northeast is also up there as a tourism experience, partly driven by food, the South and the West. And we're lucky that we have this incredible campaign that the TAT has been driving for many, many, many years with Amazing Thailand. And it gives us an opportunity to present the um, variety of dining experiences, gourmet festival to street food. It encourages rural development, 
Uh, we're diversifying the spend and resources beyond the traditional catchment of hotels to operator to going into the uh, small time uh, food suppliers and improves rural employment and income levels as we see tourists uh, going more to Chiang Mai, going more, starting to go to the northeast. Why they're going to the northeast? Culinary tourism is driving that. The global appetite for food media will continue to grow. This is where we're consuming and have this insatiable appetite of information on food. TV food channels, TV shows featuring local regional cuisine such as Anthony Bourdain who led the genre, uh, food documentaries, online culinary travel shows, food blogs, anybody can be a blogger now, or a vlog with video, get out your phone and take some video of the street vendor, social media posts, websites, traditional offline with newspaper and magazine articles still remain influential, and obviously word of mouth recommendations. All of that has driven the growth and will continue to drive the growth of the tourism, uh, cult uh, the culinary tourism to Thailand. Uh, Gassicorn uh, Bank did a research uh, in 2011 and, tr and looked at assessing what's the value of a Thai cooking class and how much is it generating into the Thai economy. 250 million baht, they estimated, from Gassicorn Research Center in 2011. And that's featured in a report that was produced by one of the professors at NIDA. Uh, back in 2012. So a, a huge market that I know has grown. It wouldn't surprise me if we've added another 50% on that, keeping in view the growth of uh, food tourism being the most uh, dramatic. TAT, you can't see this, but one of the main landing pages of TAT and also their overseas offices is food. They're selling this whole dream that you're gonna have an amazing culinary experience in Thailand. And two months ago, I was at Queen Sirikit, and Kun Yutasak, the governor of TAT, was on stage rolling out TAT's new master plan for next year. Local experience, and one of the key foundations and pillars of this is the street food and the local experience. Then we've got international tour operators who are helping us. Uh, this one is, I have to put my glasses on to see there, the, uh, one of the companies in Europe, uh, toursglobal.com, uh, I think it is, and they're offering eight days taste of Thailand, and somewhere in there, there we are, 1,700 euros, and you get to have uh, a great experience of uh, a tuk-tuk ride around Bangkok, visiting street food. You're going into Yawarat, Chinatown. Uh, they then take you to uh, Kanchanaburi and Ayutthaya, a great itinerary that just doesn't keep you in one destination. So again, that tourism spend is going out to um, at the population at large. And then the local tour operators, Bangkok Taste Adventures, a company that's online on social media. Pick your tour. Would you like the, um, the great Ayutthaya adventure, which is all food-based? TripAdvisor, uh, the portal where people will go and look and rate uh, Bangkok food tours, 1,331 have said excellent for a particular food tour operated by Bangkok Food Tour. So there's an opportunity and Keeping in view the estimate of tourism spend in Thailand and reports globally saying that a third of tourism spend is on gastronomy tourism, whether it's going to a restaurant or some form of dining. Um, I, I didn't take a third, I took a fifth. And if we take a fifth, that means my guesstimate for this year, half a trillion baht is spent on gastronomy tourism in some form or another. That's a conservative figure. That's based on dining in restaurants, Thai cooking classes, the um, food tours that we saw. So it's a huge market opportunity for us. And the attraction of Thai food has been great. This person here is Mr. David Van Schalkwick. He runs one of the largest event companies in South Africa, based out of Cape Town. 
a very high-end, high-demanding client. And when I was uh, working for Amari Hotels, he gave me around uh, 15 million baht worth of business. To secure that business, it cost me under 1,000 baht. Because I said to David and his colleagues, look, we're always dining in the hotel. Let me take you to Yawarat, T&K restaurant, which is fantastic for seafood. And I wasn't sure because I'd never taken a business client there. And he loved it. And now, whenever he's coming back to Thailand with business clients, and maybe uh, each of his groups is larger than 3 million baht spend up to 10 million baht per group, he's talking purely about going to T&K restaurant. And these um, uh, shrimp cakes, Todd Mangung, is driving his whole experience. Uh, every time I call him, he says, I must come back to Thailand for the Todd Mangung at T&K. Not about the hotel experience, not about the uh, travel. It's amazing how Thai food can have this impact. However, there is this tug of war going on. And that tug of war is between TAT and BMA. The Tourism Authority of Thailand, as you saw on the website that I showed you, are doing an incredible job, as is Kun uh, Wirasak and TSAP, in promoting the uniqueness of Thai um, culinary experiences, the Thai food. Come to Thailand, enjoy one of the best uh, foods in the world. But on this side of the tug of war, you've got BMA. And now BMA are trying to close down the street food. If you come to Suen Plu in Saturn, the street vendors that have this most amazing gastronomic experience are saying, we're closing by April next year because BMA are clearing the streets. And so we actually have this big challenge that's facing ahead of us that somehow we need to lobby the Ministry of Tourism and Sports and TAT and hopefully they're going to win this tug of war and not BMA because I see the biggest attraction for us is the street dining experience that everybody's talking about. And uh, from a mice perspective, because I said I'd talk about mice and I'm just coming to the end of my presentation, an important component of bus a business event is food. And these slides come from a presentation that I normally give to university students regarding just purely mice and getting into the mice industry and the challenges we have. So um, if you're looking at dining for uh, a business event group, uh, catering is one of the most important aspects to planning an event. It can make or break your corporate event. And in my, the last hotel I worked, Chef Peter, who had been with us for 13 years, behind the scenes, preparing a, a five-course fine dining meal at a fabulous Michelin star restaurant, at a palace, at some luxurious building. No, this is behind the scenes at a Thai boxing stadium, a Muay Thai stadium. Uh, and we have sold this many, many times. And clients uh, for that evening are paying around 9,000 baht per person to have a catered meal at a Thai boxing stadium. And Kuntitima at the back, who works for Mari, will know well this uh, experience. Anyway, uh, for group events, group dining, so options in terms of mice, which is meeting incentive convention exhibition, you can dine at a restaurant, you can dine in the ballroom or a function room or at an event space. So that event space would be a garden or, like I just mentioned, the fantastic... Um, Muay Thai boxing stadium, or you can dine off property at an outside restaurant or event space. Those are the options open to corporates. And factors for considering uh, catering is venue, um, i.e. the accessibility to that venue. Uh, Kukrit House on uh, Soi Kukrit in Saturn. Fantastic venue. The first time we used that, uh, we had catering trucks, we had uh, 100 guests going there for a dinner, and private catering. Uh, but we, what we didn't realize is the Soi is very narrow, and the coaches cannot get down there, and our catering uh, trucks couldn't get down there, and everything had to be hand-carried. So accessibility of the venue and the dynamics of the venue need to be considered. The menu, is it appropriate for the client? 
and sometimes mistakes are made there. What's the theme of the event? Do they want a traditionally Thai, royal Thai evening and recapture the highlights of Siam? Or do they want a more contemporary feel? Um, and one element that's been very popular is that street food, where we've gone out and brought uh, street vendors into the hotel, and they've been part of the whole culinary experience. Plan B, something really important from a business event perspective. What happens if it rains? I've had a group of ambassadors and Her Royal Highness Princess Sirintorn dining at Wat Arun when we used to do the dinners there, and it started to rain, and we had no backup plan. And so that taught me plan B. Plan C, it starts raining, but the guests haven't arrived, and then it stops. Do you go back to your original plan, or do you move to plan B? Venue restrictions. Uh, now we can't do anything at the Wat Arun because of the uh, religious implications and some DMCs messing around over there uh, with inappropriate entertainment. Uh, but venue restrictions. Can you serve alcohol? Um, is the venue open beyond 10 o'clock? What's the noise restrictions because of the neighbors? So that needs to be considered. Utilities and supply. Uh, so we were looking, uh, we had Orangina from Europe, the drinks uh, company from France, and they said, we want a unique gala dinner. So uh, they'd done everything. I said, why don't we do Orangina on ice? So I took them over to Mega Bangla at Sub Zero, and I said, we're gonna create this most amazing dining experience on this ice rink for you. And then they said, great, we're going to buy this. And we were selling it at, uh, I think, 12,000 baht per person for a dinner, four-course dinner at the ice rink. But then we looked at utilities and supply, and we couldn't get good access to the electricity. And they showed us the kitchen, which was two meters by two meters with a microwave. And my chef needs to cook, and then we need 100 staff for plating up so they can pick up the plate and take it to your table. And there was insufficient uh, utilities and area for us. Experience of the catering partner is really important. Entertainment, what entertainment is there going to be? Most MICE events, business events, incorporate an element of entertainment rather than just eating. And the budget, what's actually included? There are things that can go wrong. Poor food handling, hygiene is a big issue. I've had groups that have been sent to hospital because of poor hygiene. We ran out of food. Uh, rain and no backup plan. Forgot to book the venue. Surprise, more guests turn up. Venue is double booked. There's a power blackout and we forgot 800 forks. Every one of those, apart from the forks, has happened to me in my career in events. Every one of those things. And you think you can plan and plan and plan, but life hits you. And it's not just me. Across the industry, other uh, destination management companies will tell you the same. But the 800 forks happened to this lady. I'm Sandy Corum, the catering coach. My company, the Festive Kitchen, is going to be catering an event in just a few minutes for 300 guests. Let me tell you something. This is a rooftop, and rooftops bring back bad memories for me. About four years ago, we were going to be catering an event on a rooftop in downtown Dallas, kind of similar to this. One hour before the first guest arrived, we discovered that we didn't have any forks for our guests for either dinner or dessert. Talk about panic. I was stressed out to the max. Because I'm not a restaurant owner. I don't own 800 forks sitting in some closet that somebody can just run up to me. We rent all of our forks. And check this out. The rental company was 40 minutes away, one way. Somehow we got the forks a few minutes before the first guest needed them. Now note, I didn't say before the first guest arrived. I said before the first guest needed them. Because of that event, I learned a huge lesson. So gastronomy tourism is not all wonderful and lovely tastes. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. And one of the big issues is not just the forks that we always used to joke about. It's obviously the hygiene. And if we're taking guests on to street food, we need to ensure that the hygiene is there. Uh, more catering considerations from my elements of the hotel. Venue access, as I mentioned, Cookrit House and a few other venues. We can't get our catering equipment there. Cook it house. Thank you. Uh, and space for cooking that we had at the Sub-Zero that we had to say no to as the venue. Uh, 
plating up pickup areas. Uh, we had an event at the um, Royal Thai Navy Hall on the river for 900 guests. You've got 900 plates waiting to be picked up and served to table. That needs a lot of space. You can't fit 900 plates on this stage. So you need to look at what's going on back of house. Hot and cold storage units uh, are needed. Um, I was an industry function three weeks ago and they served uh, the main course and it was cold. And it was horrible. And you would not expect a five-star hotel, actually four-star hotel, to deliver food that is cold. Food to be catered uh, needs to be fit for the climate and timing of service. And then what makes that dining experience for a corporate event? What's the arrival experience? How are we welcoming the guests? Are we giving them some food and drinks or is there a cultural performance? Pre-dinner immersive activity is there? Could there be a caricature artist? Is there fortune teller? Um, is there some games going on? A reveal and possible twist. You, you present dinner to somebody and then actually it's not that, it's something else as I did at the Sanctuary of Truth in Patia. Uh, what food do they want? The finale is equally important. How do you wrap up the dinner? Uh, the fanfare that goes with that. Do we want a military marching band? Do we want the Bangkok Symphony Orchestra, Junior, 21-piece, or full BSO with 50-piece orchestra? Uh, what decor, staging, audiovisual, and staffing? So here is at the River City, and we had a group from Indonesia, and the organizer had spoken to our chef, Peter, about the menu. And the organizer had lost the plot, and there was um, uh, pork uh, on as a starter and pork cutlet for the main course. And we were doing outside catering. The first course came out, and all the first courses came back to the kitchen. And the second courses came out and went back to the kitchen. Uh, they don't eat pork and there'd been miscommunication. And we had no other food or resources at that venue to cook anything else. And through bad communication, those guests only ate dessert, mango and sticky rice. Uh, thankfully, we had it all documented, but it, it wasn't, didn't go down well. Uh, 820 tire dealers from South Africa and the client said, we want a really memorable dining experience. Uh, we want a four-course Thai dinner, and where can we have that? They were in Patia, so I hired the Sanctuary of Truth, and we had the Bangkok Symphony Orchestra, we had an Italian opera singer, and they dined there. Uh, Siemens Electric uh, in Chiang Mai, and we organized a dinner here. I went overseas, and I came back uh, the day before this event, and I was horrified to see that my staff had sold an 11-course dinner outside catering at Camp Howie, Howard's house in Chiang Mai. And nobody in their right mind would serve an 11-course dinner when you don't have a kitchen. Uh, but we used the Four Seasons, Chiang Mai, and they did an amazing job. And I always use them as uh, an example of really good logistics for outside catering. Then there were 207 Australians who went to Phuket and they said, look, we've done all the Thai food, we've done street food, we need a gala dinner that's going to be so unique and representative of where we are in the south and a tropical island. So I said, let's do dinner on an island. But for 207 guests, I laid out one table on uh, Got Rang Yai that has no hotel. We arrived by boat. They were served a six-course six southern Thai dinner on this one long table, just for them. Okay, they paid 17,000 baht per person to do that, but gastronomy tourism doesn't have to be your 50 baht uh, <laughs> mu on the street. Uh, we can sell a great opportunity here. And then we've got the, here, a gala dinner for um, that guy David, who was there with his Todd Mangung, this was one of his events at the Amari Watergate, a gala dinner, Bangkok Symphony Orchestra, all this room that's being produced uh, just because the guests want to have a nice dinner. And the money that goes into the Thai economy, uh, and all the guests had these uh, Thai silk shirts made, uh, we had entertainers, incredible event.
Okay, this is the boxing stadium that I was talking about, where we uh, do an ama amazing event. The guests are welcomed by the boxers. We do floor plans for the guests, and then we transfer a boxing stadium for your own unique dinner. And they can go back home and say, I had dinner at a Muay Thai stadium. Not many people can claim that. And the uh, opening um, performance from Bangkok University, who are amazing with their acrobatics. As I mentioned earlier, there we've got Chef behind the scenes with his whole crew plating up. Um, also on, on the river, uh, we've got uh, Chakrabong Villa. Uh, and we had this for a gentleman's 50th birthday from Singapore. I was in Chef's office, and we're talking about what plates we have to buy to present the food. So it's not just cooking the food, it's how you present it. And the supplier of the crockery came in and benefited big time on an order where we bought the plates to actually serve the six-course dinner. Another dinner down at the amazing Chakrabong Villa, there with Wat Arun in the background. And there is me sitting with my former gastronomic team delivering outside catering. I'm coming to the end of my presentation here. Uh, this is the garden, which you would not normally look like this for a dinner. And obviously all the staff come together from our talented ice carvers um, and selling the ice carving, which is very much engaged in culinary tourism. And that dinner that I mentioned at the Royal Thai Navy Hall for 927 guests, that was an eight-course Chinese set banquet dinner. We had to deliver eight separate dishes to 927 Chinese sitting down there. That's an amazing logistic. So elements that you need to think, gastronomy tourism, as I mentioned, is not just two people going to a restaurant. The big money is in these corporate events and from hotels that are presenting food in unique ways because it increases the price and spend and how we present the menus. Every little detail goes into the whole gastronomic event and how we, what desserts are we serving? And maybe for an appetizer, pomegranate served in these little cones. The creativity that we're injecting into the cuisine and how we're serving the traditional Thai element, how the staff are going to be dressed for that 927 event. And the bartenders, are they trained? Are they mixologists? Do they know how to uh, mix the, the cocktails? And then normally at Amari, when we have an event, we'll do a mock-up table here. And this was just one client where we show what your table could look like for your corporate dinner. And the work that goes into that dinner, you've got the chef, who has to prepare the food, and he's engaging with food suppliers, buying food, maybe we're doing an organic menu. The banquet staff are providing the service, delivering it to your table, removing it. They're setting up that table decor with the fabric overlays, with the decorative elements. Then the events team are designing and crafting what the whole experience and setup will be. Florist comes in with the budget that we give them. They have to go and buy the flowers and then set up the floral decor, very important. Contractors come in and build the stage, a wooden stage, and a whole backdrop as a replica of the Grand Palace. Uh, Audio-visual production, really important. Otherwise, you're talking and they can't hear you, as can happen. So you want the best AV, and that's uh, often a very big spend of the event. Entertainment, which is embracing the community at large. More often than not, we go to universities and try and bring in the, the students to entertain. Security and electricity. It goes beyond this. So gastronomy, tourism in, in, in respects of business events is a broad spend across all sectors of the industry. And something here, we had CEO uh, meeting and we wanted to do something different. So we gave them a cooking, cooking class, but in the kitchen of the hotel where very few people went and then the chefs actually cooked for them. And I did a storyboard where they would meet at the executive lounge at the top. Uh, there would be a group photo. We told them that the restaurant was the way they were going to have dinner was double booked. We took them down to the laundry. They got an apron and hat that was customized with their name. They then do 20 minutes of cooking, fruit carving, ice carving with chefs. They then sit down for dinner. We had dancers, entertainers in, caricature artists, and everyone receives a certificate. In this case, they received a certificate to party. 
a client came to me, we want a colourful dinner, and so there's the entrance to the ballroom. We brought in the elements during cocktails, colourful drinks, uh, colourful elements, the fruit carving, which is always brought into many events, the ice carving, Kim and Jike. Uh, postcards that we brought, and then she would write your name in Thai, which the Farang love to have their name written in Thai, and how it is. Uh, flower garland weaving. We found him on the street just around from the corner, the Thai barista. Uh, he was around the corner outside Central World, and we said, come in, and he's our squid man. We hired him more than 20 times to bring a local element. And again, putting the uh, tourism spend beyond a five-star hotel to the local vendors and the, the crepes, and then somebody that we found at Chachachak doing the caricature artists, and then obviously hiring the traditional entertainment uh, there with the dancers, and on this occasion we also hired um, the Joe Louis Puppet Theatre that was sponsored by uh, TSEP as a special event for this evening, as you see there, very, very popular. Uh, one guest who was celebrating his 50th birthday, give me just five more minutes please, uh, this was a cheese and champagne um, cocktail reception at midnight. And the whole concept was importing over 50 cheeses and Chef had five months to order cheeses from around the world and uh, bring them in. Uh, some import restrictions, but we managed it and it was a mid midnight buffet for 100 guests. An ice bar was carved for champagne uh, for those guests. Uh, Natasha uh, from her jazz band was brought in and um, the ladies who were organizing it wanted the, a birthday cake brought in in a unique way. I was very conservative and was against this, but the client's wishes and gastronomy tourism can lead you into amazing things. Thankfully, it wasn't me with the six pack uh, and they're presenting the birthday cake uh, there and you get some amazing things when you get involved in gastronomy so then that same client the next night wanted a delicious memorable dinner that was unique unforgettable and tasty so we transformed the ballroom and we set up two long banquet tables because so often when you do business events and the culinary experience is at a round banquet table or a square table for four or ten people and we wanted to shake things up and set up these two long uh, tables here and the detailing where we spoke with the client about the flowers how would the menu be presented the actual menu card. We went out to Chachachak and bought these chandeliers and the candles that were long lasting and then we spoke with housekeeping who folded, I think we went through eight different serviettes to fold them in the way that finally the client wanted. We showed him a presentation months before he said that's how I want my menu presented there and we ended up with this. Uh, for that particular dinner, a hundred guests, uh, very, very light entertainment and they paid, I think it was 16 or 17,000 baht per guest uh, for that particular unique dinner, taking the entire ballroom. One section of the ballroom had been um, divided with black drape that we then opened to reveal a 24 meter heavenly buffet with all desserts. This really doesn't give it justice, but it was the width of this room presenting uh, amazing culinary delights. And finally, and really important element of uh, the growth of gastronomy is the impact that Indian weddings are having. This is Chef Siddhar from my Patia hotel that I used to work at. Um, Indian weddings are really important because they're also driving uh, the gastronomic element. Uh, one of the buffets that we set up outside for the Indian wedding and they build this wonderful mandap and we had four, there's going to be 400 Indian weddings, according to TAT, coming to Thailand this year. And each of those weddings is spending around 10 million baht per wedding. But an interesting thing is, every Indian wedding is focused on food. It's more important than the bride's dress. It's more important than the uh, family of the bride and the groom. They are focused on food. And it's not uncommon for Indian chefs to be brought into a hotel and cater. Uh, the wedding that we had here, in the kitchen, we had 16 chefs from India 
cooking food on top of what our hotel chefs were cooking. Their uh, weddings, Hua Hin is number one wedding destination in Thailand for the past three years. Sheraton Hua Hin had 23 Indian chefs brought in to supplement their chefs. Families are spending a lot of money because they want the family favorites on top of what we're delivering. And uh, coming near to the end, tourists and visitors plan their trips partially or totally in order to taste the cuisine or place of the country and the activities related to it. That's a statement I started with, and I think that's the opportunity for Thailand. We have such a strong product offering, but it comes down to the P, which is not product, it's promote, promote, promote. And we're lucky with Amazing Thailand, uh, which I actually think should be called Amazingly Tasty Thailand. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, do, does anybody have any questions? No? I've, I think I've overrun. So, we're going to go for uh, a coffee break, and then you're coming back for a very um, interesting session uh, to wrap up this afternoon. Thank you. So, so we would like to say thank you to his great experience about the guest gastronomy, tourism, and next, I would like to invite Dr. Tertai to give the seminar for Mr. David Carr.